And this is Deion Dawkins, man. And you're listening to The Scoop on OwlScoop.com. You already should know. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Scoop, OwlScoop.com's podcast, season nine, episode 21. We have a full house today. I'm John DiCarlo, joined by Kyle Gauss. Declan Landis, Ramir Vaughn, and Johnny Zawizlak. Got a lot of good stuff ahead for you guys. More Temple Hoops, the men and women, some football recruiting updates, answers to your mailbag questions. Coming up later in the podcast, you'll hear my conversation with Temple Associate Head Coach Michael Huger. His relationship with Adam Fisher, of course, goes back to the two seasons that they spent together on Jim Laranaga's staff down at Miami. We talked about this. 8-10 Eight and ten double basketball team. The two games they lost down at North Texas and SMU. What's ahead for them this weekend against Rice? Some good stuff. Good details about the roster, the future of the program, and a whole lot more. The scoop, as always, brought to you guys by Greenspan and Greenspan Injury Lawyers. If you've been injured while on the road or the highway in the crash with someone else's fault, the insurance company is not going to be on your side. You need us, Temple Law grads, who will fight hard to get the compensation that you deserve. We only get paid if we win. So in Pennsylvania or New York, call us today at 215-261-7359. That's 215-261-7359. And you can find them on the web at greenspans-law.com. That's greenspans-law.com. Gentlemen, where do we start? We'll start with Declan. He's wearing a robe. Yes, I feel like a king. It's wonderful. Is it embroidered? No, I want to get it embroidered, but my sister said that was a waste of time and money, which I thought was rude. I disagree. Do you think it's a waste of time and money? Yeah, what do you feel? I mean, I'm broke, so. You can learn to embroider take your yourself. Advice. Embroider yourself. I don't know how to do that. But what is I've got shaky hands. What if did I Did you not take up? home ec at the Hogwarts that you went to? No, we did not take home ec, unfortunately. I wish we did. I'd probably be a better cook. Dude, I took a lot yeah. of home ec. I think, I think we talked about this on the scoop before. I took double home ec my senior year. It was sick. Yeah, I oh, bet it was. Double like home you... act, double gym, my senior year. <laughs> really? When did you have actual class? Uh, I went to a state school for college, so I didn't need to get actual class. Amazing. <laughs> no. I mean, at that point, like, I'd met my prereqs for all this stuff, and I just took, like, it was, like, food, cuisine of the world, and then something else. There was a sewing class. I took freshman gym and senior gym. It was sick. <laughs> did, the, did the downingtown curriculum get easier so the gym thing i had to do because i didn't take gym my freshman year in indiana because it was a swimming uh year and i didn't want to do swimming so i didn't do that I get um, and then once i get to downtown like well, you need to do four years of gym so i did do freshman gym as well so it's just again we talked about this a 17 to 18 year old post puberty boy going up against 13 to 14 year olds some of them not having gone through puberty yet it was a great class i got to just like <laughs> to dominate kids in softball and kickball <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'd do it again i'd do it again in a heartbeat i told you this got a screaming match with the gym teacher about whether or not i was safe at third that gym teacher is now um the head basketball coach at westchester university he's a d3 basketball <laughs> coach we're just screaming at each other about whether or not i was safe he was khalif wyatt's boss a couple years yeah. ago Damian yeah, Blair. yeah khalif wyatt two years ago <laughs> yeah i think we talked about this because we talked about um we talked about home ec and we talked about shop class and i made like that we made those generic toolboxes with like little yeah. thing in the wood yep. handle so proud of it wrapped it up as a christmas present gave it to my dad he opened it on christmas morning he was like what the hell is this <laughs> is it an ashtray what is this it's a toolbox <laughs> i did a dustpan but same concept you're like bending yeah. the metal into like a dustpan and then i took electronics which was just like a, a variance of of shop it was great yeah. I also took a class called Brandywine Flows, where you just canoed in the Brandywine River every oh. every Friday. We didn't have that option. We did. We'd go canoeing, and then we'd stop somewhere, and we'd test the water, and be like, yep, this water's not good to, it's not potable, it's not ready to drink, and then we'd get back in the canoes, and off we'd go. <laughs> Primary, you went to, yeah, and I, I keep, I've probably asked you where you went to high school six times, I forget the name again. It was a, a high school for smart kids, a specialized school. What, what sort of, like, specialty classes did you get to take? Not... Not many is like I took. I guess I took engineering, but but that was that was Not about it for for la like, di da. That was before the uh, in <laughs> I the took alternate engineering. No, no big deal. La like, di da. He's using robotic was... arms. I'm out there with making sure that the stoners aren't getting caught smoking <laughs> behind the tree and during brain one flows. But, <laughs> but you're you know performing open heart surgery with this robotic arm. 
<laughs> that's the alternate universe where Rymir went to Drexel instead. Yeah. Yeah, it is I, actually. It yeah, is. I, I play that scenario out a lot. I'll say this with my brother graduated from Drexel. I've never met somebody that went to Drexel that was happy during their time at Drexel. No, my dad's the same way. He was like, yeah. everybody was studying all the time. Yeah, it's just yeah. like they do trimester, it's all co ops. Like, it's just, it's a different experience. My dad went to Drexel, but I think he was working like 12 jobs when he when he went there. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't thrilled. No. No. Johnny, any exciting high school classes you can tell us about? No, I, I wasn't special. I, I went to a normal high school. Ew. I still say that. <laughs> Your gear, though, like you, you have, no Rams, you have high school gear. And you still fall for the joke where I say, Johnny, where did where did you go? I oh, I know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I'm I'm I still I still wear my high school gear proud. I'm not I, I didn't just throw all that in the trash like everyone else. I didn't I didn't throw my high school gear in the trash. Oh, First of all, my my, the, my high school gear probably doesn't fit me anymore because it was from 1994. So I used to have a sick downtown um gym like classic like the gym uniform basically, but it's just like a t-shirt. I lost that a decade ago. That was a good just, shirt. Just a yellow t-shirt. It was gray. It was gray with blue, like downtown West athletics mm. or whatever. And mm. that was that. As yeah, it's a, like freshman class and just me senior scrawl across it. <laughs> <laughs> Rough to a roaring start as always. Famous number 21s, guys. It's a good number, right? Got a lot of, lot of numbers to choose from. Jagger Garden. I knew you were going to go with somebody Temple related. Honestly, that's just off the dome too. I remember him as 21. Uh, Joel Embiid. LaDainian Tomlinson. LDT, let's go on. Johnny, you got anybody? Um, does Jimmy Butler still wear twenty one? No, he might be twenty two. Wasn't Jimmy Butler twenty three guy? He was twenty three in Philly, at least. He was twenty three in Philly. I knew that. He was twenty one. He was twenty one on the Timberwolves. I knew that because that's when the Sixers traded for him that season. Twenty one wasn't available because Embiid had it. I'm thinking of the arguably the greatest right fielder of all time. Roberto Clemente. Yes. R.I.P. Exactly 3,000 hits when it's playing with them. Um, Frank Gore. Yes. There you go. Early Roger Clements. I mean, there are some there are some huge, huge names that we haven't Dion. gotten to yet. Oh. Ah, Dion, Dion was in my head. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I said Tim Duncan. I don't know if anybody heard me. Yeah, oh, 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 I yeah. definitely oh. did not hear that. Yeah. Tim Duncan. We said Coach Prime. We said Deion, Deion Sanders. Coach Prime. No, I said Dion. I didn't say Coach Prime. <laughs> coach Prime <laughs> doesn't wear a number. Yeah, he's a <laughs> coach, John. They're on the sidelines. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Sometimes oh, coaches do. Declan, win. who we? I just thought of this. You mentioned him last week as not being a fan. Of this guy's when we were talking about famous number twenties. Oh, Tiki Barber. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He stinks. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Tiki Barber either. Yeah, Tiki Barber got that's like the go to people who talk about fumbleitis. How could you beef with Eli Manning? Not the best guy off the field either. That's what I'm more. That's what I mean. Personality wise, the dick. Yeah. Um. But yeah, if he had like that stretch of like four years where he fumbled a lot. That was fun as an Eagles fan. But yeah, then I think he was. figured it out. Give me, give me a former Eagle who wore number twenty one. Who some people are trying to um, get him uh, like a push to get him into the Hall of Fame. Eric Allen. Allen? Yeah, Eric Allen. Eric Eric Allen. Yeah, yeah. I think he's he's a finalist this year. I think. Yeah, yeah. I believe was, so. Right. Yeah, that was before my time, but he's a he's a finalist. That was when John used to. He wouldn't know if the the Eagles won until three days later when the postman came to the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> When the Pony Express would find its way out west. I was just going to say the town crier gets <laughs> in the center yeah, square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The birds of Philadelphia. <laughs> Johnny, why are you crying? Dearest mother, <laughs> the Philadelphia football team is lost and I'm distraught. <laughs> All right, so we promised you guys at the outset of the show an interview with Temple Associate Head Coach Michael Huger, and he's joined us now on The Scoop. Mike, thanks so much for making time for us today. I appreciate it. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. No problem. Like so much to, cool stuff to get into today with your long career and how successful you've been. But we'll start with some of the present day stuff and where you guys are now. You're eight and ten overall, one and four in the conference heading into this weekend's game against Rice. We know what some of the obvious things are that you guys have struggled with and shooting the ball. And I know you guys, you know, you know in your heart of hearts that you need some more pieces for the, the future long term, but you know, 18 games in, what's your big picture assessment of what you've seen so far from this team and this program? 
I think we're headed in the right direction. Uh, I think we work extremely hard to get to this point. Uh, the guys have put in a lot of work um, to get better, to improve, and to buying into what Coach Fish wants these guys to do. Uh, I think we've improved from where we started, so that's the that's the biggest thing. Most people haven't seen the beginning, and when you see the beginning, it's like whoa. But now we've made some steps and some strides, and we still got a ways to go. Uh, but I think we're putting it together, and we, you know we're playing better. We're closer in the games against SMU. We were right there couple of possessions here, a couple of calls there, you know, that changes the complexion of the game and, um, you know, a couple of turnovers that hurt us down the stretch, but, you know, we're putting it together. The guys play hard. We're competing. We're competing and uh, it's been fun. One of the guys who's obviously struggled with this shot has been high seer and five of these last six games, he's 0 for 31 from three. And then he had a really good game against Wichita state. I know he, he becomes a popular talking point for the fans and they say, Oh, is he taking too many shots? And, I get that, and I'm sure you guys get that, but I also know he's your best ball handler, and he's a leader on the floor for you guys, and and he's critical in breaking presses and doing all those things. When it comes to his shot selection, his shooting, and I'm sure he gets this too. You know, I'm sure he he hates that he struggles with a shot and he wants to be a leader. When it comes to his shot selection and shooting, do you guys think he's taking good shots and they're just not falling, or is he forcing some stuff? Is it a little bit in between? And what do you guys do with him to work through that in in-game situations in terms of just like getting his confidence back with this stuff and when he should shoot and when he should be, you know, looking to dish and stuff like that? Well, it's a combination of both. Um, you know, it, it's a combination of some bad shots and some good shots and uh, mixed into there. Uh, when you take tough shots, I wouldn't say bad shots, more, more right. tough shots that he takes. You know, but we ask him to do a lot. I mean, he has to do a lot for us at this stage. He's playing a lot of minutes. You know, the shots have come. You just have to continue to work and, and be confident in the shots. He's getting some really wide open ones as well. And those are the ones that we expect to to knock down. But a lot of times is, you know, we got to get him off the ball a little bit more, which is what we've been trying to do is getting him off the ball so he doesn't have as much pressure on him. And now he can kind of play a little more free, a little more relaxed. So it, it's a combination of of a lot of things uh, rolled up into one. And, um, you know, the biggest thing is shot selection is always the key of shooting a bad percentage. You've got to do a much better job of shooting, shooting um, you know, good shots and all of the stuff. So uh, it's been, it's been, um, you know, a process for him and I think he's getting better. And I think as, as the season goes on, you'll see him improve. Where do you think his confidence is right now? Because you know how hard he works and, and how seriously he takes what he does. And again, I, I don't think from where I said that he aims to go out like taking 10 threes. And sometimes maybe some of those shots come late in the shot clock. And again, like I said, you know how hard he works and how hard he works on the court and off the court. Uh, it looks like when he was able to get to the rim, like the other night at SMU, he had that M1, great move to the basket, reverse layup, and you guys were still in the game at that point. Is he the type of guy that stays pretty even, or does he? do you think he goes through his frustrating bouts where you know, the shots just aren't falling and some of them are going in and out? I think it's more internalized. He doesn't show it a lot outside. He doesn't show his frustration as much, so you don't see it. Uh, he definitely comes in and works on his craft. So he's he's not one that's just, you know, laying around and coming in, in the game and shooting shots. So, you know, he's working on it and improving it. So he's definitely taking better shots. Now it just has to fall. You know, he has to get his proper rest and, and be ready to go when the game starts. So we try to, you know, get him as much rest as possible, but it's always difficult. So, um, it, you know, it, it's one of those things where right now the shot isn't falling. Uh, but you know how it is as a player. Once you see one goes in and, and now he's two and three and, and that's what it is. So uh, we just got to see that one fall for him. And I think everything will change around. From what I can see in comparison to his previous two seasons, it looks like Jill White maybe is playing some of his most confident basketball of his career. And I know he's had bad luck with injuries and re-aggravated that ring finger injury and I know there's stuff he still has to work on. He had nine turnovers in the two games on the Texas road trip, but he means so much to you guys in terms of how he can drive to the basket, how he defends, how he rebounds. What is it meant to just have him back in the lineup? And what have you seen from him? Uh, versatility. His versatility is is great. I mean, we can put him pretty much one through five with the way we play and he can go in and, and, and be successful. Uh, he's done a great job of passing the ball and, and rebounding the ball and defending. Uh, now we just got to cut the turnovers. That's, that's way too high, you know, for a guy of his caliber. So, 
uh, we got to do a much better job of of him, you know, limiting his turnovers. You know, you're not going to really have zero turnovers. You're going to have a couple, but I'd rather a couple instead of, like you said, nine in, in, in two games. So uh, way too high, And um, but he's playing well for us, and hopefully we can keep him healthy and keep him on the court. Do you guys know if he'll have Steve settle back, you know, for, for Rice, or is that still kind of like a day-by-day uh, -day thing? It is day by day at this stage. So we'll see how it goes tomorrow. If he's feeling better, if he's feeling better, then he'll definitely be in for the game tomorrow. We're starting to really see Jordan Riley come into his own and you know his game. You can see how athletic he is at both ends of the floor, his ability, and you can see why Big East schools were recruiting him, how he ended up at Georgetown. Where do you see his game right now? Can you tell us when you guys are recruiting out of the portal, it's so fast and so furious and it's quick decisions. What stuck out about him, you know, when you guys were looking at him out of Georgetown and where do you see his game right now and how he's progressed? Size and athleticism is what we saw. Uh, ability to get downhill, uh, scoring the ball in a variety of ways, uh, being able to defend. Those are the things that we saw out of Georgetown. And then the people that, you know, we knew out of New York spoke highly of him. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was one of those things. You In the portal, you don't really know. It's not the time that you get as a high school kid where you get a chance to recruit a kid uh, throughout the year and then you get to know him. And uh, the portal is very fast and very furious. So you have to be in and out. And that's what we did. And uh, we had to gather as much information in a short period of time. And a uh, great kid, uh, great personality, fits us well. So he's been doing a great job for us. Um, he's been playing extremely well, uh, getting downhill. The, all the things that I just described is what he's been doing for us and uh, defending, rebounding. He's doing a little bit of everything. So that's the biggest thing. We got to just keep him going in that direction and keep uh, going upward. I wanted to ask you about Zion Stanford. Adam has talked to us about him, was pretty honest with us and saying he told him, hey, like beyond the ankle injury, you have to start learning like what it takes to compete at this level. And he, he had that obvious success early on in the non-conference portion of your schedule. We've seen what he can do. He looks really composed at certain times driving to the rim. And and now he's been back in the lineup over these last couple of games and getting his minutes back up. How do you think he responded to that? How do you think he's responded so far from that feedback from Adam and spending more time on the bench and now getting back into things over these last couple of games? He was definitely positive. As anybody, when you get your minutes uh, reduced, you know, you want to fight for him and get him back. And and that's what he did. He fought for his minutes to get him back, uh, started to get healthy. Was The biggest, biggest issue was him being healthy. He wasn't healthy during that stretch. So for him now getting back healthy, he's finding his way back, um, starting to play a little bit better, a little bit more confident in his ability. And I, I think he'll continually improve, and, and especially if he stays healthy. Uh, he's definitely a, a, a big part of what we do and how we want to play. So hopefully we can keep him healthy and, you know, no injuries come back up. But he's starting to play well. He had a, a good run down in Texas, uh, you know, where he showed us some things. And, you know, hopefully that'll continue. Going back to the point guard position, tell me what you've seen from Quante Berry so far. I know that, you know, after redshirting at Providence, he's essentially 18 games into his freshman season. And he was a big part of that that big LaSalle win for you guys in triple overtime, just getting to the rim and really kind of grew up a little bit in that game. And I know a shot didn't fall for him the other night at SMU, but he only turned it over once in 18 minutes, had three boards, two assists, two steals on a block. Are you guys starting to gain more confidence in him and putting him on the floor in more important minutes? And is he starting to kind of maybe hit his stride a little bit more? Yeah, I definitely think he's he's starting to hit his stride. He's, he's playing with more confidence. Uh, we have more confidence in him. Uh, he's defending well, rebounding well. All of the things that we need him to do, he's doing. Uh, distributing the ball, making his teammates better. Um, you know, those shots, he took great shots. Even though they didn't fall for him, he took great shots. Uh, it's difficult because, as you said, he's still only 18 games in into his college career. So he's still learning and developing. And uh, I think he has great instincts uh, for the game of basketball. And it's starting to show on the court. He does things that, you know, none of our other guys are doing at this stage. A guy who hasn't played much, but he gave you some energy the other night was Tosh Sweet. And I know his minutes oftentimes can maybe depend on, you know, a bunch of things, how he's practicing, the matchups, time and place in the game and all that. And I know that Adam said that in the second half, the way the game played out, that kind of dictated his playing time. But what have you seen from him and what does he need to continue to do to get on the floor more and give you those short bursts, whether it's defending, rebounding, like being an energy guy and some of the stuff that he does? Uh, the biggest thing is the energy that he brings. He brings uh, great energy to, to 
the game. Whenever he gets in the game, he affects the game right away uh, with his athletic ability. He runs the floor extremely well. Uh, just have have that knack. Uh, you know, he has great timing and everything that he does. And um, it's just fun watching him, you know, not play a couple games and then all of a sudden he gets into the game and he affects the game right away. So uh, it, it's just, you know, when you sit for that long, most people will lose confidence in what they do. He doesn't. He's no matter how many minutes he plays, he plays extremely hard and he finds a way to affect the game. So if he can continue to do that, I think his minutes will increase. You had a big role in recruiting Sam Hoffman out of the portal. And I think he's mentioned that you know, your playing time professionally overseas in Belgium helped with that connection. How much did that relationship help? And what has Sam meant to you guys? Cause he's, you know, between his build and like, he's, he's a unique player for you guys that you can rebound, do a little bit of everything. And, he's had these stretches where you can see just how much he affects the game. Even if a shot isn't falling, he was critical in that Drexel game and some others. Tell us about how you guys got him out of the portal, how he's helped you and what, how that relationship of like playing over in Belgium maybe helped you get him. Well, Sam was more of a last minute thing. We were down a big and someone called me about Sam. And uh, once I called my guys over in Belgium and, you know, had the connection to his family uh, he knew people that I knew over in Belgium. We just had a great connection, spoke on the phone, and we hit it off from from day one. So that was the thing. We hit it off from from there, and uh, it was just fun. Just getting, you know, seeing him was only on film, mm -hmm. and you know, the first thing my guy said, yeah, you know, they they listed him at maybe six six or something. And my guy said, yeah, he's probably more closer to six five. <laughs> he was like, he's probably my height, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's how it went, and. Uh, just got a chance to talk to him and his people and the people around him. And it was great just talking to him and getting to reconnect. And once we got him here and watched him play and knew that he would fit, you know, Coach Fisher's per, uh, system perfectly. And and so he did. He was able to pass the ball, very skilled, uh, can rebound the ball, rebound out of his area, uh, make a great teammate, great teammate. He's probably one of the best uh, with the guys. And uh, it's just been positive and a, and a great experience to have Sam with us. Two guys that are they're gonna be big parts of your future are having really, really good high school seasons right now. Dylan Batte and Aiden Tobias and Dylan, of course, down in, in Texas. And then Aiden looks like he's the best player in the state of Delaware right now. I know during the course of the season, you may not to may not be able to get to as many of their games, but two guys that were have signed now and you can talk about what did it mean to get those guys and, and what do you really like about them in terms of how they can factor into your future? Uh, both are, are so different, but both are a need. Uh, Aiden is able to play uh, point guard, off guard, uh, very skilled, high IQ, can shoot the three, um, smart. Uh, it's just fun to watch him play. The way he plays with ease, uh, the biggest thing for a freshman, as always, is getting bigger and stronger, and I think that's what Aiden would need uh, coming in. You know, most of the stuff translates once you get to college. Defense is the biggest thing that – you have to work on when you come in because it's a new concept, new style of defense, new way to play. Uh, Dylan is 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 already a, a college athlete. His body is phenomenal. He's 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 already a a step ahead when it comes to the physical aspect of the game. You know, and now we just have to get him you know skilled up in all the things of the way we need to play of shooting the three, and I think he rebounds at a high rate. So that's already there. I think that translates to college, the rebounding. So I think once he gets here and the physicality of understanding how physical it is and, you know, just getting comfortable in the pace of the game is just much faster than high school with the shot clock and all the things that, you know, in certain states they don't even have. So, um, you know, just getting them those guys acclimated to the pace of the game and the physicality of the game is how quick we can do that is how quick you'll see them on the floor. Going back to Aiden for a second, you and I both know like there aren't too many sleepers anymore in terms of recruits. But in this time last year, nobody was really talking about him as a D1 recruit. And his recruitment really took off in a short amount of time. And he said, like, hey, the AAU program I was playing for wasn't one of the big time circuit programs. And in the span of a few months, he really started to get noticed more. And you guys came in at the right time and he seems to have a great attitude, doesn't really have like these bad habits or anything like that. And it seems like everything kind of just came together at the right time. And now people are saying like, wow, Temple got a really good player 
a steal, a high major recruit. Can you just talk about how that came together for you guys? Because it's kind of a cool story. Like even in, in July, August, still people weren't sure if like he was a high major recruit. And now he really looks like a high major recruit. The biggest thing is the is the shoe circuit that he played on. I don't think it was a shoe circuit. It was just a circuit. And, you yeah. know, most guys don't see those those teams. If you're not with Nike, Under Armour, Adidas, if you're not on the bigger circuits, no one get really gets a chance to see you. So he may have had some Division II schools and things like that that saw him, you know, because they're all over the place and they don't have the the limitations that we have in recruiting. Um, Chris uh, Clark got a ch chance to see him early and he was the first to recognize him and, we all went out and saw him, you know, during the year. And I thought he would be a great fit with the way he plays and the style and the pace that he played with and the skill set that he had. And um, once we got Coach Fish out there to see him, he fell in love with him as well. And that's that's how it really came about. Once once all the dots was 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 punched and, you know, uh, everybody got a chance to see him. Uh, Coach Fish was the last to get out to see him and. Once he, we all said the same thing about him. We all had our different opinions of him, but it was all the same opinion. And uh, at the end of the day, Coach Fish got a chance to see him and he fell in love with him and that was it. The rest was history. Uh, got him up to campus. Uh, him and his dad got a chance to show him around and talk to him and um, he had a great time. And, you know, a couple of days later, he committed to us and we were very excited to have uh, that type of talent in, in our, uh, you know, first full recruiting class. And, uh, we get a chance to evaluate him and see him during the season. And we got a chance to see him and he had a great game. And I think he'll be a great fit for us. Going back to how you got to Temple, you obviously have the, the common thread with Adam from the you know, the two seasons you guys spent together at Miami under Jim Laranaga. Did you kind of know that you'd be his first call? Yeah, you know, after things ended for you at Bowling Green and the friendship that you guys have, like, did you kind of know things would come together once he got the Temple job? Actually, uh, I did. He actually called me and said he had a couple things in the works. Would I be willing? And I said, you know, let's see what happens and then we'll go from there. I didn't know exactly what was going on at the time. Bowling Green still um, had to pay me, so I could have just sat back and, and relaxed. And, but, uh, you know, once Adam got the Temple job, I'm from New York, uh, it was a uh, it was a situation that, you know, I'm two hours away from my family and, and able to recruit New York and go back and forth. And uh, it was a great opportunity for me, he offered me the opportunity to come down and, and work with him here at Temple. And I, I jumped at the opportunity once I, you know, knew everything was for sure. You know, it's hard when you go in ifs. I might, I might get this job. I might get that job. It's kind of hard to put it in and say, yeah, I'm going to go. If he gets this one, I'm going to go. If he gets that one, I'm going to go. But in his situation, whatever opportunity he would have gotten, I probably would have went with him. But Temple to come here was more of a no-brainer to get this close to home. I've been coaching now 18, 20 years, and uh, never been this close to home. Closest was Fairfax and George Mason, and that was a four- or five-hour drive back to New York. So, you know, being an hour and 45 from home and being able to recruit New York and come back here in New York, New Jersey, has just been fun. And especially working with Adam, you know, this thing runs full circle. Uh, I was the one that got him the job at Miami to start. Yeah. So that that was a great, great uh, payback for me, you know, for him to now have me come down here and work with him. And I was going to ask you about that, too, because now what's the dynamic like for the two of you on the bench in terms of like your conversations and what you see and how much he leans on you? Because you have had coaching experience that that he didn't have before getting here. What's it like on the bench? You can even just see from, from a distance, like how much he leans on you and how much he'll consult with you. And, and how have you seen him evolve so far as a, as a head coach? He's evolving very well. He's, he's owning uh, being a head coach. It's definitely more difficult one seat over. Everyone thinks it's easy to be a head coach and it's not. You deal with so many things, basketball, on the court, off the court, everything falls on you. Wins and losses, everything falls on you. So it's a lot of pressure on you every single day. Most people only see the finished product. They don't see the work that we put in before we get to that. And that's where he's at now. He does a great job of consulting us, not just me, but the coaching staff. Um, my, my biggest thing is suggestions. You know, I, I always say to our guys, we, as assistants, we make suggestions all day. We make a million suggestions. The head coach make decisions. It's a big difference between suggestions and decisions. So 
I just give him suggestions and, you know, things that put things in his head, the ideas, and then he comes up with the other stuff. So uh, that's all that, that I'm able to do with him. You know, I want him to be able to run the program. You know, I had an opportunity to run, run a program and I want him to have this opportunity to run the program. So I don't step on any toes or any of that stuff. You know, if he takes my suggestion, great. If he doesn't, great. It is it's still the same thing, but it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. I'm 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 really enjoy enjoy being here at Temple and you know with Chris Clark and Bobby Jordan. We've had a great time. We work well together and it's just been fun. So that's the biggest thing is having fun with it. At the end, I know things didn't work out for you the way you wanted at Bowling Green, but you did have success there in eight seasons, and you had success in a place that's that's not always easy to have success. You recruited some great players there. Who knows what might have happened for you guys during the COVID season, and what did it mean to be able to be the head coach for that long at your alma mater? And just when you reflect back on that time, what do you what do you think of? What will you remember from that time? Oh, it was it was a blast. I had a great time. My wife is from Cleveland. My wife Tanya is from Cleveland, so it was two hours away from her home. Uh, we met at Bowling Green. Uh, now having the opportunity to come back to my alma mater and be able to coach was was uh, it was the best thing that that could happen. You know, for me, you know, having my first job, uh, I went through three ads. So that's that's a big difference right there. When you're going through three ads things change, you know, philosophy yeah. change, the way sure. they want to do things change. Um, you know, the the portal changed. It, it, it just changed college basketball once the portal opened up. And then COVID changed everything. Our teams were built to win during COVID. Uh, 2019, we went to the championship, lost to Nate Oates and his Buffalo team that probably, I think, went to the Sweet 16 that year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, very good, a close game. We had an opportunity to win the game, but we didn't. The following year, uh, we were right there again. Uh, that uh, that team could have easily won the MAC that year and took us to the NCAA tournament, uh, but COVID hit and we had to shut down everything. And and you know it was a 20 win team. You know it was a team that won 22 games I think that year. So we definitely had another opportunity that that slipped away. And then the year after COVID, you know that was just a tough year of college basketball with no fans and. Yeah. We played off the crowd, had the greatest, you know, crowds in, in school history during that time, during that span. And, you know, once you once the portal hit and opened up, we're trying to navigate the portal and figure out a way to use the portal to our advantage. And, you know, it kind of backfired on us. And and that's it. You just didn't I didn't have the time. We didn't have the time to survive the portal and just figure out a way to navigate the portal. And, you know, it was time for those guys to make a change. And that's what they felt. And. You know, I understand it. I know what college basketball is all about, but I still got love for Bowling Green and my players and, you know, all the things that we created, you know, all the guys that I have that's playing professional basketball right now, uh, the guys that I still have at Bowling Green, the guys who transferred out, who's having success, having a lot of success. So that shows that we weren't we weren't off in our thinking in the way we did. We just couldn't get those guys to, you know, play together. We all know that the obvious, obvious success that Jim Laranagas had as a head coach and I'm sure he'll be in the Hall of Fame at some point. I know he was a first time nominee last year. Beyond the obvious stuff, because you know him, I would imagine you probably know him as well as anybody else. Tell us why in your eyes he's been so successful, because you, know, you guys have the, the New York connection. He recruited you. You played for him. And then you worked for him at George Mason at Miami. And I know you were just breaking into to coaching and not at Mason when he had the the final four run and then people around the country really started to see not just how great of a head coach he was, but how great of a personality he was and the country kind of fell in love with him. What makes him so special and what did you learn from him? The biggest thing I took away from it is how to evolve. And that's what he's done. Like he, when he coached us, he wasn't the same way. He was still learning his craft. He was still learning how to be Jim Laranega. And at that time, he went from Jim Larrelega to Coach L. When he got to George Mason, he turned into Coach L. And that's that was the difference right there. You know, with us, he was Jim Larrelega. When he got to George Mason in Miami, he turned into Coach L. And that was the evolved the evolution that he had of of becoming who he is right now today. Um, you know, he he was great with people, always great with people, great with the X's and O's, communicated awesomely with all of the guys you know he has a relationship with most all of the guys that played for him from Bowling Green to George Mason to Miami 
Uh, they all want to come back and talk to him. They all want to be around him. Um, and, and that's what it's about. You know, he helped, you know, guys grow. It was one thing that I took from him is, is how to turn these young men into grown men. You know, when you get them, you know, most of them are, are boys coming out of high school and then they turn it into young men when they leave. And he's done a great job of help molding those guys into what they become later on. So most of them always come back to whether it was George Mason, whether it's Miami, whether it's now at Miami and his George Mason guys come down to see him. So that's what that's what it's about. Of, of he was able to evolve and, you know, stay relevant in a game that's, you know, full of young coaches at this stage. And he's still a re re relevant at the age that he's at now. Before you played it at Stevenson in the Bronx, what's your earliest memory of playing basketball? Like what what got you into it? <laughs> I can tell you a, a, a true story now. Mm -hmm. I was 12 years old. Uh, a guy who lived in my building, Lamont Moultrie, mm -hmm. they were having trials for the TS Bucks. And it was a, a local team. Tommy Swinton uh, coached our TS Bucks team out of Harlem. And they were having trials in the back. And Lamont said to me, you coming out for tryouts tomorrow? And it's a Sunday. I'll never forget it's Sunday. I said, no, nah, I'm not going for trials, man. I'm, I'm going to think I'm going to play football. So Lamont said, we call him Mo. So Mo said, man, we don't have no football around here. There ain't no grass nowhere to be found. You better come out tomorrow. <laughs> you scared. You scared. That's exactly what he said. You said, I'm not scared. I'm not scared. So uh -huh. I came out. I was I was probably this height. I was probably six foot at 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 uh at twelve. Wow. So I was a big man. I actually made the team. We had all of the best kids out of Harlem, and I never played. Uh, well, I take that back. I always played, but it was because we were winning by fifty points, and then I finally get in the game. But I wasn't very good, and that's my earliest memory of starting basketball. But I, I wanted to be more than that. I wanted to be better. And I, I started to work on my game and take it seriously. By the time we were 14, I was the best player on that team at, at 14. So it took me two years to really work at my game and get better. I wanted to play AAU basketball with Riverside Church out, yeah. in, Bronx, out in Harlem for Mr. Larch, Ernie Larch. Mm -hmm. My teammates were Adrian Autry, who's now the head coach at um, – head coach at Syracuse. We played together. Brian Reese, who was on that uh, national championship team in 93 with North Carolina. Uh, Sean L. Scott. We were loaded. We had a yeah. very good team and a lot of fun playing with those guys. And uh, from there on, I went to Stevenson High School in the Bronx, played for Steve Post, who coached Ed Pickney and Fred Brown and those guys. They all played. Dedrick Irvin, Kyrie Irvin's dad. All were on that same high school team, went to that same high school, and we won back-to-back -back city championships, uh, which is equivalent to winning states out here. You yeah. know, it's, it's a big deal to win city championship back then. And uh, came on and, and played for Coach Larinaga at Bowling Green. And after that, spent 12 years playing professional basketball in Europe. I spent nine of the 12 in Belgium, and that's where I met Sam and his family and all of those guys out that way. So it's been a great journey for me. I started coaching at Longwood in Farmville, Virginia, for uh, Mike Gillian, who worked for Coach Larinaga for some years, and then went with Coach L for four at George Mason, four at Miami, and then now here, uh, eight at Bowling Green, and now um, here at Temple first year with uh, Coach Fisher. Those names, like going back to New York for a second, like the number of big players, big people that you are around in New York, every city kind of like has its own basketball identity philly certainly has its identity dc baltimore the dmv and people all kind of like to claim their own identity tell me what it was like in like new york city basketball atmosphere because it's it's big time basketball again like it's just some of the names that you mentioned the people that you got to cross paths with how competitive is it and how much does it toughen you up it's big time games every week, every month, every night. What was it like if you had to explain New York City basketball to somebody? It was it was mayhem. It was something <laughs> totally like just out of the ordinary. You got to think back then when we played, it was the top 24 players from New York City. So you either play with Riverside Church or you play with the Gauchos. Yeah. Those were the only two teams back then. And if you made one of those teams, you basically made it. You were one of the top 24 players in, in New York City. So back then, we had battles with, with, with the Gauchos and 
then we'll go out of state and we'll play back then. The AAU teams were one team from each state. So we were probably one of the few that had two teams out of the same state. Most states just took their best players. Like Jersey had the road runners and Bobby Hurley played with them. Terry DeHair, Jerry Walker, Luther, Luther Wright, I want to say his name was. So they all were on the same team with the road runners. And now they were really good. They had a they had a very good team. And 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 that was what made it fun. You just went all over the country and played against all these other guys. And that's what made basketball fun at the time. It was so competitive because now you're taking the best from each state and putting them on one team. And now they're going to play and represent that state. So that's what made it fun back then. Uh, it's changed now. Uh, you know, AAU basketball is, is New York, especially. We got about 50 teams. So it's so different now. And 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 now it's about the sneaker circuits. And, you know, you can't play on this team because you with this shoe company and oh it's so crazy now we didn't have any of that we were sponsored by nike mr large had a deal with nike and we just wore nike gear and we just we just went out and played we went all over the country to play we even took us to france one year and we played out in france so it, it was just the the competition was so good because we didn't have all these other distractions either we didn't have the internet we didn't have facebook uh instagram we didn't have much Snapchat. They got so many different distractions and and it's all about likes and different things like that. We had none of that. We just went out and played. And that was what made it fun. That's what made it special. And, you know, this is the world we're in today. So we got to evolve and we have to adapt to what college basketball is now. And now with the NIL and all the other stuff, it's totally different now. Like you mentioned, it is totally different, but do you still get a special feeling when you go up there to recruit? Now, again, you guys have players from all over the place, but obviously there's still a ton of great basketball up there. And like you said, you don't get to you don't get the chance now to build some of those relationships over two, three, or four years. But when you go up to recruit in that area because of where you grew up and because of the success you had there, do you ever kind of like stop and reflect? Does it kind of blow your mind to say, wow, like this place was such was such an important city and area molding me and now I'm coming back and recruiting there. What is it like when you're recruiting in that area and you have so much history there and you know the lay of the land so well? It is always special to go back to the city and see all the guys, you know, most of the guys who are coaching AAU and these high school teams, we all grew up together. Most of those guys are, you know, guys that I've known over the years and, you know, even the younger guys now are like, you know, one of my teammates' son is coaching a high school team. So it's, it's, it's so crazy now of when you go back and see so many people and they all, you know, you get a chance to see them and they tell their teams on how good you were as a player. Like, he was very good. This is my teammate. We played together and I, I played against him. So you always hear it and then that kind of makes you reflect back on a different time of, oh, yeah, I remember playing against him in high school and the different things like that. So, or in the basketball tournaments, we have a ton of basketball tournaments over and throughout the city. So we always used to go and then we used to travel to different areas. We go to the Bronx to play. We take five and go to the Bronx. We go to Brooklyn. So we went all over New York to play basketball on the weekend. So that just brought back a lot of memories. And, you know, a lot of these guys are now in the NBA coaching, NBA stuff, doing skill development with the NBA. And just the other day we went down to Dallas and uh, one of the guys, Nico Harrison, is who uh, he's the president of basketball operations with the Dallas Mavericks. We were over in Belgium together. So, you know, wow. we just got a chance to talk to him on the phone and, you know, Shamgar Wells is one of his uh, player development. He played at Providence. He was yeah. he invented that that crossover that everybody do now. So yeah. he was the inventor of that. So just got a chance to talk to all of those guys. And, you know, it's just, just basketball is such a small world, but it's such a big world at the same time. So it's been a lot of fun, you know, just being a part of it and making this, you know, my life. Like, I know basketball can consume your life, but when you're not, coaching when you're not working if you're able to like decompress what what's life like for you now like where do you live what do you like about philly what do you do when you're not consumed by basketball if you, if it's possible to get some free time um the biggest thing when i'm not i spend as much time with my family as possible so my little one michael he's playing at uh abington friends so mm -hmm. we're in the abington area in that jenkinstown area and um 
it, it's just it is I, I just try to spend as much time with them. So if he wants to go work out, no matter how tired I am, I take him over to the gym and we get a workout in and uh, you know, if my wife want to go walk around, go shopping, we go shopping. I go walk around with her and just hang out with her, no matter how tired I am. So that's the one thing, you know, I always wanted to make a priority. If I had any free time and they wanted to do anything, I would make sure I, I find time for them. And and that that that's how I spend most of my downtime is 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 with my family. So you know, whether my brother is coming in town, which he has, he's in town now to come to the game tomorrow. Uh, just, just, I'm, I'm a big family guy. So I try to spend as much time with my, with my, uh, immediate family and, you know, even extended family, you know, we go on trips, my mom had 13 brothers and sisters. So we got cousins for days. Our family reunion is like 500 people every time we go to a family <laughs> reunion. So pretty much my, my, <laughs> we got Jimmy Polisi here. So I, I give him my ticket request. And he said, man, do you got family in every state we go to? I said, pretty much. We got family in every state, every state. So I said, they down in Florida, South Carolina, they all over the place, Atlanta. I said, they're everywhere. So they always ask for tickets. So I try to, you know, accommodate them as much as I can. What's something that maybe people wouldn't know about you? I always like asking people a lot. I'm sure you've done a ton of interviews. You've been interviewed as a player. You, you've been in the New York media scene. You've been a head coach. You, you've been around Coach Larnaga. What's something that maybe people wouldn't know about you that you maybe don't get a chance to talk about? Two things. My my last name is pronounced Hugh G. So we're from, my mom is from South Carolina and dad from South Carolina. And our last name is pronounced Hugh G. So when I came up from New York, I was born in New York but kind of raised a little bit in South Carolina at a young age. So when I came up to start school in New York, I used to tell the teachers my name was Michael Hugie. And they were like, how'd you get that out of, you know, this? So they started with Huger. So that's how it became Huger, because I couldn't explain. I'm a little kid. I'm in, I'm a six, I'm six years old, seven years old. I couldn't, I couldn't explain that to any of them. So I just, I just left it alone. So it was Huger. But anytime I go back down to South Carolina, where my family is from Cross, a small part of South Carolina, uh, probably, I want to say, north of Charleston. They always say Hugie. So every time anybody calls me, it's Hugie. So uh, that's how my last name is pronounced. And wow. the next, uh, I've been I've been collecting shoes for quite some time. So I have an extensive sneaker collection, uh, probably probably about 300 deep now. I, it was oh, up wow. To, uh, five or six, but I had to, I had to trade some in and give some away. I just had too many. So when I moved, I traded in a lot of shoes just to upgrade, you know, to a nicer pair. So I trade, I trade shoes now and stuff like that. So those are the two things. Does your wife ever give you a crap and say, um, where are we going to put all these? Like, does she ever tease you that's, about that? That's what started me uh, trading in shoes. So I would trade, you know, probably five pair to get like one expensive pair. So uh, that that's what started it because I had too many of them. So I started to sneak them in her her little area of the storage room. And she got upset with me because she, you know, seeing all my shoes in her spot. And uh, so I said, all right, I, I, I cut that number down. So you're not going to win that battle, number, right? That, no, I'm not going to win that battle. So I cut the number down drastically right now, but uh, I still have quite a few. What's your favorite pair? Do you have one that that's, you're just like, I'm never getting rid of these? Is it like a pair of like old school Jordans or something like that? Or something it, it's, different? It's, I have two. I have I have a, a Travis Scott Jordan 1 Lowe's that I love. They're, they're very nice. And I probably have the Jordan friends and family that I really like. Those are the two that I would probably say I like the most right now. I have the Air Force One Tiffany edition. So I, I have quite a few that I really like. <laughs> wow. Like this, this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Best of luck to you. I'll see you tomorrow over at the Leah Corps Center. Again, you guys are taking on rice tomorrow. So thanks for making time today. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. You have a great one. You too. Thanks, Mike. Big thank you to Michael Huger for, again, taking some time to, to talk to me and joining us on The Scoop this week. Again, the Owls take on rice Saturday at the Leah Corps Center, so we'll see if they can break this losing streak that they're on right now. Temple went 0-2 on that road trip to Texas with losses at North Texas and at SMU. I guess maybe one of the few bright spots is that Joel L. White 
is back. He scored double figures in each of those four games since he's returned to the lineup after re-injuring that right ring finger. He's averaging 12 and a half points, 6.2 rebounds, shooting just above 46% since his return. Adam Fisher moved him back in the starting lineup on that Texas road trip, and he's averaging almost 30 minutes a game in those four games. The only downside is he uh, has a combined nine turnovers in those two games against North Texas and SMU. They come back to the Leah Corps Center on Saturday against a Rice team that's 6 11, 0 4 in the American. They've lost five in a row. So it should be a winnable game for Temple. But again, they've been up and down. We've talked at length, and we'll talk about it more in the mailbag, I'm sure, about how there are limits to the roster. As for Rice, Dave, again, they lost five in a row. Two of their three last three losses have come in overtime. They're starting to play a little bit better. They lost to UTSA and Charlotte in overtime. Travis Evey and Mekhi Mason are their top two scorers. Max Fiedler, their 6'11 forward, could end up being a problem for Temple, as we know. Not a roster that's 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 good on size. ECU's bigs gave him problems, so a guy uh, like Fiedler could give him problems. He's just shy of averaging a double-double this year, 9.9 9 points, 9.4 rebounds. So, again, could be a winnable game, should be a winnable game, but it's hard to tell. Rice's coach, Scott Perra, was a former Penn assistant under Jerome Allen. He was also an assistant at Arizona State. He recruited two players at Arizona State who helped beat Temple in the 2009 tournament. Kyle, can you name them? No. <laughs> one, is, one is very famous. One is not as famous. Wait, what year is this? 2009 Arizona State roster. Oh, James Harden. Two. Yeah, Harden's one of them. Um, didn't I? There's somebody else that hurt them that game, but that's also a little pre-my time. Who was the other guy? His last name contains the word that you would see when you look in the mirror. Adonis. No. <laughs> uh, well, well played. No. I must have missed that guy on the roster. He was... <laughs> I don't know. I only know Harden from that team. Derek Glasser. Glass. Glass is the word I was looking for. Glass. I don't see the glass, though. You see reflection. You're right. The De- glass is reflecting is... light back to you. Teclan got a real Jesus good Christ, John. <laughs> oh, I'm trying. That was so good. I'm trying to make this interesting. <laughs> Ramir and Declan got a huge kick out of that. John used to shake his head. Anyway, glass was the last thing I thought of when you said that. <laughs> I was. My mind went the same place Kyle did. Like you're seeing Adonis. yourself. I thought you were using like I thought you were going to take a burn at me. Like this you're is right. what you would see. It's like blemish or yeah. something. It's, <laughs> oh, instead, you said you're talking about the glass. That's crazy. I was off the cuff. I don't. I mean, I'll I'll do better next time. I Derek Glasser, though, he recruited. I got to, I got to put my 2009 jobs. Arizona State players in a better position to make plays on this podcast. Yeah. So, yeah. See what he's up to now. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, well, you know what? We'll talk about this team more in the mailbag because we have a couple of questions about them, and I think the fans again. I get it. They're upset with where the season's headed, which is not to the NCAA tournament. Wait, real quick. Derek Glasser is now an assistant coach at Santa Barbara with JPL. Full circle. Really? Yeah. Before that, he was on Rice's staff last year. Now he's at uh, Santa Barbara coaching up Josh Pierre Louis. Full Hmm. circle. Interesting. Circle of life. Mm -hmm. Sing it. Declan, you can sing it, right? Can you sing it? You don't want me to do that. I want to, but you don't want me. I know how this plays out every single time. Johnny is a is a songbird. He could sing it. I I am okay. You don't you don't want that, just like that one said. Johnny only sings Creed exclusively. Okay. Now that's <laughs> second week in a row where he's got you, ever guys, you guys ever find yourself down the TikTok hole where it says like the so and so as AI singing the song? Yes. Yeah. Like like Cartman singing Evanescence or something like that. That remind yeah. me of that, like Johnny Cartman singing, singing. Cartman singing Evanescence though, like plays, like it's like, oh yeah, it's actually pretty good. Yeah, there are a bunch of them on like Instagram Reels. I don't do TikTok. I do Instagram Reels. And you YouTube just get shorts. TikToks two days later. Then that's like, fine. Instagram I Reels the same thing, just two days later. I don't mind. I've they tried, usually I've age like fine wine. Well, what are you talking about? You're on YouTube Shorts too. No, that's four no. days later. No, I'm I'm on TikTok first, but then if I get bored of TikTok and the ads that are on TikTok, I go to YouTube Shorts. There you go. When no ads, TikTok it's first became a thing, were any of you like classic TikTokers where you were like, let's do a choreographed dance? No, I have a couple of those look, in the vault that will never be released. <laughs> <laughs> look who you're talking. 
I was late to the TikTok game. That that entire fa- like fad had gone by by the time I was on TikTok. By the time I got to, you know, the elders, it was, it was done. <laughs> no, I do. I have a couple in the vault that you do. I'm I'm not willing to let go of. How have I never seen these before? Cause I just said I am not willing to let go of them. When we're done here, I'll... uh before we before we start talking women's hoops, two questions for you, Declan. Again, I I still I'm I'm. Well, whatever became of the Temple News Christmas album, and um, when are we going to hear Caden reciting Twas the Night Before Christmas? Two great questions. I'll answer the first one. We had three tracks before we realized making an entire album in two weeks was a little bit too much to <laughs> handle, especially when those two weeks were uh, the last week of class and finals week. So we do have three tracks that the one got copyrighted and taken off of SoundCloud, so... Uh, you know, if you're interested, DM me. I'll send you, you the ran link. Out of, so you ran out of studio time and money is what you're saying. The record company, not happy with you right now. You not happy with the... sacred off SoundCloud. It's... Yeah, it got, the <laughs> one got copyrighted, which was brutal. Just right off the bat, like didn't even stand a chance on the website. So that was a <laughs> I mean, tough break. Frank Sinatra's estate is ruthless. <laughs> no, it wasn't even, it was, uh, which one was it? Oh, it was, uh, wonderful, it was our wonderful Christmas time parody. That was uh, entitled Wonderful Print Weekend. That's and, not like uh, public domain yet? Since no, isn't one. that crazy? <laughs> and we, huh. I mean, to be fair, we, <laughs> actually, I probably shouldn't admit this on the podcast, but we did rip it off of karaoke YouTube videos. So that's how we got the backing tracks. <laughs> so it was, we were playing with fire to begin with. You could have just gone to like anybody's like, like generic Casio keyboard and just played the little synth, like ding, 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 ding. That would like require recorded uh, to songs that. in the top right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second one, John, I have COVID. All right, get off my back. You know, I'm working on it. I'm here to push you to be your best. Yeah. Well, COVID's here to push back. <laughs> Did anybody else miss Kyle's? <laughs> no, I miss that. <laughs> anyway, this Temple Women's team, guys, did we did we jinx them? Did we jinx them? Um, I incorrectly said last week that if they beat Memphis, that they could be playing for first place in the conference this week because Charlotte had a game in the middle of the week, which they won last night, but. They had a winnable game. We said in the pod that they should have beaten Memphis, and then they did not beat Memphis. So now Temple is now tied for fifth place in the conference standings with Tulsa at 3-2. and two. They're 9-8 overall. They will play Charlotte. Again, still a big game, an important game for them this weekend at the Leah Kors Center. But a lot of, you know, you guys were there, a lot of mistakes and mental lapses in this game with a chance to really put their foot in the ground and just move forward, and they didn't. What happened? You know, they they had a stretch of two good games. Ramir, you pointed out that ever since Diane had called out her team's defensive effort, they were starting to play better. And then last weekend happened. What what went wrong for this team and why did it go wrong? I I I think it's the the turnovers has been a really big part. I mean, back to back games where they've had twenty plus turnovers, and I I think that uh, really hurt them. But I think just overall the defensive effort wasn't what we had come accustomed to and especially what we saw on that uh road trip uh that really kind of put them into another gear and we thought they were going to continue that going forward um i yeah i honestly i couldn't really tell you like what like went wrong like it just it, that wasn't the team that like i i was expecting to see come out and play a game that they should have won maybe it was uh, and I'm assuming here, but maybe they saw Charlotte on the schedule for the next game, and maybe, maybe they could have overlooked Memphis a little bit. But I, I, I don't see a team like a Diane Richardson team kind of doing that. So I, I really don't know kind of what went wrong and why there was such a lack of effort. Yeah, I mean, good teams have bad games. I think is what it boils down to as well. But the and you'll hear Coach Richardson say that right here. But the energy, like Johnny said, was not at all where it needed to be. And here's a little clip of her saying that. Well, I, I want to tell you all, I am truly embarrassed at our effort today. Just, uh, it's point blank. I'm just embarrassed at our defensive effort. 
Um, we had done such a great job on the last few games with our defense. Today, we didn't do as well as we should have. Coach, Enos Piper got in the foul trouble early and they kind of attacked the paint once she was out of the game. Is there a, a game plan to go forward just in case this happens again? Someone else stepping up? Well, you know, to be quite honest with you, I, I think quite a few people should have stepped up today. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we, we get in situations, there are going to be fouls called, whether we like them or not. Um, but that shouldn't impede us from doing what we need to do. And people need to step up. That's what happens in basketball. Like people get in foul trouble, people get hurt, somebody's got to step up. And I don't think we were in that frame of mind today to step up. Well, let me ask you guys this. So so both coaches, Diane Richardson and Adam Fisher, you could say, are, are rebuilding their programs. Diane's a, a year ahead of where Adam is. Like you said, Declan, I mean, good teams can have bad games. We know that. But should they... Again, they've still got pieces to add. They're not, I, I think Diane, if she was being honest, would say, yeah, I, I still have a few holes on my roster to fill. Obviously, everyone's entitled to, to getting better, but should they have been past a moment like last Sunday where, I mean, again, like you guys can talk about the, even in, inside the game's last 10 seconds, another mental lapse there in terms of waiting to get the ball up the floor, when to foul, should they... I mean, no coach, no player is going to love that stuff, and they're all going to say we need to do better. But should they be past some of those moments by now in, like, year one and a half of, of Diane Richardson's tenure? Is the roster experienced enough where they should not be having a letdown like they did last week where they had to – they fell behind, they came they came back, and then kind of collapsed at the end? Like, should, are they – should they be past stuff like that right now? I think it depends on who the player is. Like both Jaleesa and Rain both had, you know, mental lapses to, or well, big mental lapses in that game. I can excuse Jaleesa a little bit because, you know, she is a freshman, but I don't think Rain had any excuse. I think it really depends on who the player is to where you can like excuse it a little bit. Like if it was if it was Aaliyah making a mistake, no, you can't you, you can't do that. You can't excuse that. But if it's you know, Trish and Taylor, then maybe you can be like, all right, she's a freshman. She doesn't really know. Yeah. And I mean, we talked about it a little bit last week too, about, you know, established roles. Like it's, it's different if Rain Tucker, who is by all intents and purposes, the go-to forward, right? The person that is supposed to be dominating in the post for this team. If, if she makes a mistake, it's a little more noticeable, especially than if Jaleesa, who comes off the bench for an S Piper makes a mistake, you could just sub her out and it's not like expected to be a huge drop off. But I think the other part of it too is, you know, there were six or so players that played minutes for this team last year. So like, I don't know that the cohesion is still fully there. Um, and we've talked about how that is a little bit of a problem and has been, they seem to figure it out last week. Maybe it was just kind of a, like Johnny said, they took the game a little too lightly. I don't know, but you know, it's now time to start figuring out some cohesion. It's now time to like start putting together these solid lineups that have games like we saw against Wichita State. Um, and if that's not sustainable, then they're not going to be able to make a run. But I still think this is a team that can – we saw bad basketball on Sunday, no doubt. But I think this is a team that is not going to play to that level um, on a day-in, day-out type basis. I think this is a much better team than that. But if they can't – figure out a consistent level of energy that they can sustain through the rest of the season. They're not going to be able to live up to what they could do. Well, we'll see what happens on Sunday when the Owls host Charlotte. Let's talk a little bit of football before we get into the mailbag and some of these topics will come up again in the, in the mailbag. Uh, again, if you're an Owl Scoop subscriber, definitely suggest checking out Ramir's story on Antonio Jones, the Grambling transfer who verbally committed Temple. Some good stuff there. I mean, I don't want you to give away the, the whole thing, but you, you got some some clips from the Grambling game against LSU and did a really nice breakdown of of his game, some of his strengths, some of his weaknesses. Again, without giving away the, the whole thing, just a general sense of it. What, what did you come away with in terms of what Temple could or should be getting in him? I think he's a really good receiver. He's fast, first off, like the speed pops on tape. He's quick, and he, he has some juice to him, like, 
he moves a lot better than some of the receivers that they've had previously. Mm-hmm. And he arguably becomes their best threat after the catch. Like now, right now, mm-hmm. he he's the best. Like those short screens that they love to throw, the short passes, he, he can catch one. And if, you know, he makes a guy miss or two and he has the speed to take it to the crib. So, mm-hmm. And what you saw, you saw him against LSU. And even if some of that – whether it was early in the game, late in the game. And obviously they got, eventually they got, you know, they're an FCS team going up against a, an, an elite FBS team. But even if he's doing that against later on against some of LSU's backups, there's still some really good, really good players. So 61 of his 81 yards came on the first two drives when they were still in the game. Mm-hmm. So it didn't come against backups, came up against, you know, the Tyron Matthews of the world. A lot of it came on one catch, but. He had the 34 yarder, yeah. But he had five catches in their first two drives. Mm-hmm. Would definitely encourage you guys to check out that piece. Uh, since we last recorded and talked to you guys, Georgia Tech transfer Jason Moore announced his verbal de- commitment to Temple last night. That'll be Wednesday night. We're recording this on Thursday. He was one of the visitors we reported and you knew about. So if you're an Al Scoop subscriber, you had heard his name. He had 13 tackles, three TFLs, two sacks, and his three seasons at, uh, at Georgia Tech. Fun fact about him, he was a, he was majoring in nuclear and radiological engineering as a two-time member of the ACC Academic Honor Roll. So uh, impressive stuff. That but, is a fun uh, fact. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Temple also hosted Clifton McDowell on a visit and offered him during their visit. Not sure what's going to come out of that. I don't know that based on some of the sources that we've talked to, if I don't know if he's going to end up at Temple, but it, it does show you at least, you know, some of you or a lot of you have asked, hey, are they going to keep recruiting quarterbacks? Are they going to build depth there? Yes, the answer is yes. If we do kind of put a bet on it right now, I'm not sure Clifton McDowell, McDowell excuse me, ends up at Temple. Uh, you know, Stan Drayton and Danny Langsdorf both had, had told us on signing day that they would continue to recruit more quarterbacks in that depth there. He's originally from Texas. McDowell, I mean, played at, at three different programs, played some JUCO ball, was at Montana last year. Um, Bryce Toman, Jermaine Donaldson have entered the portal since we last talked to you, a couple of offensive linemen who are on their way out. So right, so that segues nicely into our first mailbag question here, which is from Temple fan Al question there. Lost some depth on the offensive line this past week. Are we moving on from these players or are they choosing to leave on their own? Uh, I don't know who's on Bryce Holman's list, who's recruiting him since he entered the portal. I would you know, like, let's start with Jermaine Donaldson. It looked like a promising recruit at the time out of South Jersey, just never really got on the field. So I think five years, zero offensive snaps. Yeah. So, yeah. That's crazy. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd be sitting there yeah, thinking, yeah, like, yeah. They're recruiting over me. It's time to it's time to move on. In a position where, quite frankly, like they were throwing bodies out there at some points. Like yeah. they really needed guys. He could just never do it. I I think he even lost his special teams role this year. So for him, yeah, I'm sure that's a hey man, you're 23. Maybe it's best if you go try to find a spot somewhere else. Yeah. Bryce Tolman, again, could be a situation where I don't know where he's gonna end up. Maybe a, maybe another FBS program out there, see some stuff on tape that they like of him and they say, Hey, if you've got some better players around them, maybe he's maybe he can be a little bit better played a little bit better this year, but there were still a lot of times where he was just, just moved off the line. So I would, yeah. I, I think that's a, he chose to leave though. Like I think they would have liked to have him back just because yeah. of the versatility. I right. mean, like did, have they tried to recruit over him like two, three straight off seasons? Yes, absolutely. But like he keeps finding a way into the lineup and he can play center at the FBS level, which not every offensive lineman can. So it wouldn't surprise me if he stays at like the American level or maybe even goes a little higher as like a depth guy, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, next question here. Uh, second week in a row question from Chris Samp 85 with the cost of playing at Lincoln financial field ballooning up 41% to up to 4 million a year. Does Temple need to look at short-term and long-term solutions at where the football team plays Will playing at Subaru Park be a viable and affordable short-term option? Are there any other options? I think that the answer to all those questions is is no. I mean, I don't, I don't think Subaru Park is a a viable option. I don't. I think it's no. yes, no, yes. Yes, they should look for a long-term solution. Mm-hmm. Who yeah. knows what that is? Sure. No, no, Subaru Park is not. Which I was about to call PPL Park. It, was, it used to be PPL, right? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then what was the third one? 
well, the sons are there of, other options? Sons of Ben are going to be out to get you for that now. I would say yes, no, no. As of right now, the only other option is to build a stadium, and I think that ship might not have sailed, but it's pulling out of harbor. So, yeah, I but no, they're not going to go play in a, a soccer park in Chester. Yeah, like I see where he was going with Subaru Park, but it just it doesn't really make a ton of sense for the program. I feel like. Yeah, I mean, Villanova was looking at it, or reportedly looking at it, when they were trying to make their push several years ago to go FBS for football, get into the Big East. They, I think, they had floated the idea of playing there. But, the, but the, then, if you do, you recall the second part of that, Super PPL Park at the time, Subaru Park came out and said, like, no, yeah, that's right, <laughs> like, we're, yeah. like we're, we're not, we're not, yeah. we don't want a football team here, mm-hmm. like, because they were like, we'll expand it to thirty thousand, we'll do this, and Super Park was like, no, we we have yeah. no interest in that, yeah. And you can't, you know, and again, it's not even a really like a valid comparison anymore, but back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when Temple was playing some games at Franklin Field, you can't, it, 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 in no. where Temple, where, it, where we are with recruiting right now, with how far behind Temple is with NIL for NIL resources for football, Stan Drayton and his staff, or even a new staff three years down the road if Stan Drayton's not here two years down the road or a year down the road, you can't recruit to someone else's school. I mean, you're just going to be left out of the conversation unless you're really desperate. If Stan Drayton says, yeah, come to Temple, you'll play your games at Penn. It's just, it just, it's not an option. And quite frankly, for as great as Franklin Field is, you would need to pump millions of dollars into that to get it up to an FBS level. Yeah. Like the camera wells aren't there. The locker rooms aren't to that level. Like there's so much money that would go in, just go in there to invest in somebody else's property. Yeah. So no. Like every, like a couple of years ago when they practiced there during the summer, they had issues practicing there because the infrastructure wasn't there to practice at Franklin Field, let alone to play a full game with however many thousand mm-hmm. people that are used to the amenities of the link. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So these these next I'm two thinking questions. Yeah. You build a stadium above Broad Street. It just just hovers over Broad Street. That sounds like you can vote in. You know, like the Macy's parade, they bring the the, the real sky dome. <laughs> You just That'd do that, sweet. but with a full, a full stadium. That'd be kind of sick. Yeah, like I think they should either. do pickup in the uh, in the star building. You know how it's like half a field. They should just do pickup football. <laughs> Who's gonna say no? That'd be do sweet. Think, do you think? Do you think Charles Baker and the NCAA are gonna come down and be like, "Sorry, this doesn't meet our expectations"? No, they're just gonna let Temple vibe. No, they're, they're gonna be like, "This is sick." We should have thought of thirty-seven this yard field, man. Let's kill this it. This is like yeah. arena football, but better. I think it'd be awesome. Get, get Jaws. Oklahoma, Oklahoma drops 230 on top. <laughs> Yikes. We didn't pick this one out. It's Keep like running around in circles. 85. I got to the 37. What happens? Turn I mean, around. <laughs> I, would, I would take a 230 to 85 game. No, that'd be pretty cool, cool if you were like, they dropped 85 on Oklahoma. <laughs> That's sick. That's <laughs> awesome. They dropped 85 on them and lost. Leading in all the points per game <laughs> figures, but it's just like nobody knows that they're playing on a half field. <laughs> writing, a, writing a running game or that day would, would, would be tough. <laughs> they intentionally don't have a TV contract, so nobody finds out. It's all just like they, they just read box scores. And like something's in the water there, man. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Johnny would text me, I had everything written. I got to go back and redo everything. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it is 230 to 88. If you don't know where the direction of that game's going, that's on you. You should probably find another, <laughs> you should find another profession. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Um, these next 56 garbage time points. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's still so impressive. That's um, great. These next two questions in the mailbag, both about High Seer Miller and how poorly he's shooting. Temple fan Al, and then Quinn Dive is the the screen name here. Quinn Dive two. So the first question from Temple fan Al about High Seer Miller: Why is High Seer's three point shooting regressed to what it is today, twenty two and a half percent on the year? And then what well, I'll, I'll read this one as well because it's basically the same thing or along the same lines from Quinn Dive to outside the Wichita State game High Sierra Miller is over 31 from three over the last six games often it's the same no pass dribble step back miss three given that this has become a consistent repetitive problem at the point what is Fisher's role in it does he just say play loose have fun keep shooting or is he trying to correct it Miller's not getting the message either way it seems to be a coaching issue at this point your thoughts um He's shooting less. Look, look, there's no, there's no getting around it. Yeah, he, he's he's having a very, very poor shooting year. I wouldn't even say he has bad form on his jumper. I think some nights he's just tired. He's just not getting his legs under it. But does it not come back to 
I think the same issue in that there's so much around him that affects this. One of our, and it's not necessarily related to a shooting, but on another message board conversation, one of one of our subscribers pointed out the fact that he's still the best ball handler on the team sure. and that other players, their handle's just not there. I mean, Jaleel White's playing a lot better, but he's, he's still, you know, like I said, he has nine turnovers in the last two games. Jordan Riley's handle is not there. I hate to be so blunt and honest, but there's a reason why Deuce Roberts is not playing. He was a late addition prior to last year. He's just he's just not ready to play. I'd have to think that if Deuce Roberts was playing better in practice, he'd be seeing more time. Quante Berry is seeing more time. I think even if we were talking to Heisey Miller right now, he would tell you, like, yeah, I don't want to shoot 20 times a game. It's not like he's been doing that recently. But sure, I think there are times in the huddle where Adam Fisher could or should be saying, hey, Let's make sure we work the ball around to somebody else. But again, the problem is opposing defenses can say, oh, ball pops over to Matteo Piccarelli. He's the shooter. Let's close out on him. I think on a really good team, Jordan Riley is, and again, Jordan Riley's been playing better, but he's probably your third scoring option. So I don't know that Adam Fisher is just saying like, hey, you have you have free license to shoot whenever you want. But at the same time, talk to me about those other options that you think are there when – you know, they're di- they, he actually has dialed back his shot total. And I do think that they are moving the ball on offense, but they're just, they're, they're just not good enough right now. And yes, he's, his shooting numbers are what they are. They're bad. There's no question, but it's not like he hasn't given Quante Barry minutes. It's not like even again, they don't play the same position, but like he put Tosh Sweet into the game. There's not a lot in his arsenal right now that he can go to. And I'm sure that Heisier Miller is probably beating himself up over it, but I don't know. I'll turn this over to you guys. I get it. He's everybody's favorite lightning rod for criticism. I think we talked about this last week, but I, do I think that he's taken some bad shots where it gets late in the shot clock where he tries a fadeaway three? Yeah, but again, there's no one else in the flow of that offense that's an easy out to get the ball to at times. So I don't know. You guys want to chime in on this. What do you think? Everybody on the team is shooting badly. Like it's not just him. So it's hard to it's easy to levy the blame at him because he is taking the most shots, but also there's a reason he's taking the most shots, and it's because nobody else has stepped up. Well, I don't, I don't know that he necessarily has to take over. I, I think, again, I think what part of the problem is and part of the issue is if he is to scale his shot total back, which in some cases he has. Now, what did he go? He, didn't he go 0 for 10 from 3? The other, again, that's, that's bad any way, any way around. The, the numbers are bad. They're bad. We we get that. But again, I think sometimes they end up in that position where they work the ball around, they work the ball around, they work the ball around. Everybody's covered. And then, yeah, some of those like fadeaway threes he takes, I wouldn't say that all of them are like early on in the shot clock. I think some of them are late in the shot clock. And that's sometimes the result of that. And again, there's no question he's shooting the ball poorly, but I don't even know that he necessarily needs to take over. It's just they don't have a ton of options. I think it's a shame you've had that two – that one stretch where he had those two really strong takes to the rim. He had that M1 and you see him do that against the, one of the best defensive teams in the league where you think, okay, he's got that, the reverse, you know, the reverse layup, the N1. I think he's got to do a little bit more of that. I'm not saying he's been a guaranteed finisher at the rim, but it, it's just, it, it's tough because he, sometimes he takes good shots and misses them. I think even if Adam Fisher, literally, I don't think a conversation would go like this, but he's, if he said, Fabe, if you take, more than four three tonight. I'm gonna I'm gonna bench you. Okay. Where there's where's the rest of that offense coming from? Your natural take is okay. Let's get Matteo Piccarelli those shots. Getting Matteo Piccarelli those shots isn't always easy because Matteo Piccarelli can't really always create his own shot. I think it's kind of this a little bit of a like stuck between a rock and a hard place type of issue where they know what the issue is, but. You know, I, I don't think that Heisier Miller is this petulant player who's like, no, Coach Fisher, you got to let me shoot as much as I want. I don't think it's like right. that. But even if they cut his shot total down, I'm not sure what else comes out of that. I have a couple of things. Um, one, to echo what you're saying earlier about like the ball usage and like who else has the ability to actually, like when he's on the bench, they turn the ball over a lot. Like, they period. Do. Like, into yeah. that, like, even when he's struggling, like, his turnover to assist ratio, he's or assist to turnover ratio, he's the only guard that's above one on the right. team with that. Everybody else has turned the ball over more than they've gotten assists. He's an 81st percentile for assist to turnover ratio. Even when the last five games, when he's been struggling, he's in 79th percentile. So it's like, I think he's playing not out of position because obviously he's a ball dominant guard, but his role is out of position. 
like in an ideal world, we've talked about this ad nauseum. He's a facilitator who can occasionally get to the basket and is pretty good at free throws. To put in context how kind of poorly it's been so far, and this is just kind of to run fuel to like, yes, they need somebody else to step up. In the last 30 years of college basketball, not just Temple, college basketball, there have been two players to attempt like 7.6 three-pointers a game and shoot under 23%. Johnny, they both played for Temple. Can you think of the other player that shot that many threes and was that bad at shooting threes? At Temple? At Temple. Can you give me a five-year window? Sure. 93 through 98. If I give you another hint, I think it'd be too obvious. But I will if you don't get there. It's okay. Not, Johnny. Are... Not huh? Johnny Miller, is it? Johnny Miller. Johnny oh. Miller shot 22.5%. This is uncanny aspect. Uh, High Seer Miller so far this year is 31 of 138 from three for 22.5%. Johnny Miller in 1995-96 went 31 for 138. Exact wow. same, 31 for 138 for both of them to shoot 22.5%. Mm. history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes <laughs> he was and johnny miller was a, he was an exciting player at the time but yeah he transferred to clemson right yeah clemson and when he my, played, my hint was going to be that he transferred to a football school <laughs> and when he, he when he was at i believe he played at solanco high school and like he was known for like teams could key in him on so much like key in on him so much that he would just start taking threes like like a few feet beyond half court because that's where people were starting to like pick him up. But yeah, um, again, I get it. I, I, I would be shocked if Hysir is not very self-aware of how poorly he's shooting. And I, I would almost guarantee you that he probably does not want to take 10 threes, but they just, I don't know, they just don't have the pieces right now. It's certainly something that we can talk to Adam Fisher about. I'm sure that he'll get asked about it, but I don't know that it's really a coaching issue at this point. Again, I I'd be shocked if these conversations don't happen, but like Kyle just said, if you take him off the floor and maybe a year from now, Quante Berry is stronger with the ball. Maybe a year from now, Jaleel White is stronger with the ball. Maybe a year from now, Jordan Riley is stronger with the ball. Maybe certainly a year from now, they, they probably have a couple more guards in this program from the portal, but I think they're kind of stuck there. JHG722, we'll, we'll just read his question of despair here, his question, why do we bother? JHG722, you bother because you care. You've been around a long time. You can't help it. And we appreciate you subscribing to the is site. That, is that basketball, why do we bother, or football, why do we bother? I think it was basketball, but I don't know. Yeah, the, yeah, the fact that we have to ask, though, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Look, I mean, it's like the, the episode you guys did last week of why were there reasons to be optimistic about football. For basketball, it's uh, the incoming class. Right. That's why you bother. You hope that they kind of get a scheme in place this year and that you get the right pieces in going forward. Do I, I, I think a lot of what you see in terms of what they try to do offensively, what they try to do defensively makes sense. They tried, they, they went zone against SMU the other night. It helped them out. They ran out of gas at the end, rather predictably SMU just has a better roster right now. And on most nights we're going to be saying right. that. Again, I am not trying to be an Adam Fisher apologist, but and and again, we talked about this. I think as last week too. I think fans are very desirous of the meeting of, of the media getting the answers that they want. Like Adam Fisher is not going to come out and say like, "Well, if I had three more players, maybe the the results will be different." You can't you kill the locker room by saying that. But yeah, Dylan Batty and Aiden Tobiasen, like we said last week, are having. Very good senior seasons. We'll see what happens in the portal for these guys. Last uh, questions here come from Off the Hook 3 on Twitter. First question, many people don't see the American Athletic Conference as sustainable for Temple football and basketball. Where do you see our programs in 10 years? The A-10 pays pennies, and we played several A-10 teams recently, and it didn't improve attendance. I feel like Temple is stuck in a bad spot. They are stuck in a bad spot right now. I know it's not what you want to hear. I I don't know what else we can say, and I'll certainly turn it over to you guys in a second. Literally, their only choice right now is to win where they are and see what happens. Uh, like they're like 
I don't, and, and where, where they are in 10 years, like, holy crap, I don't know where college athletics is in, in, in 10 years. I know that right. sounds like the vague water cooler type of thing to say right now, but I, I, I couldn't give you anywhere near an accurate answer as to, you know, where the programs are in 10 years. But the only thing that they can do right now is to try to win in the American, improve where they are with NIL and just hope that they're at the right place at the right time. I know it's probably a lot simpler then it, yeah, it's, it's, I'm making that sound a lot simpler than it really is, but I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah. I think it's just, I, I think it's just, you need to position yourself for if something breaks, is, is that something the ACC, is that something a new conference with people of like-minded universities that don't want to spend the 30 grand or whatever kind of playing regional schools? I don't know. But all I know is that if the shoe dropped tomorrow, and all of a sudden, the ACC was like, we're trying to add four schools from a group of five. I don't think Temple would be part of it. Why would they be? There hasn't been a reason to say, yeah, Temple is an obvious candidate there. They haven't invested in some of the aspects that other schools have. Mm -hmm. I mean, Temple has been losing recruits for NIL to programs that you'd be like, how? Like, how they're in worse conferences. How do they better NIL support than mm -hmm. Temple and stuff? So, like, Temple hasn't shown anything yet to say that they're ready for a jump up so i think you need to spend the that purgatory time that yeah is the american ideal fit no is it weird that you're playing all these schools in texas yes are you going to go have to play in some terrible basketball arenas in texas yes but you need to be you need to grow where you're playing in, until until the opportunity comes to join a more appropriate one and if it doesn't if 10 years from now you're like crap we're still in the same boat then maybe take some hard looks in the mirror into that glass yeah you'll see the glass <laughs> <laughs> the second part of the second part of off the hook three's question i know it's very early but does fish have to make the tournament in 2025 no mm -hmm. i i I'll, i do i think adam fisher wants to make the tournament in 2025 yes i don't think that i think he might have said as much in his opening press conference I, adam fisher knows that you can get better quickly through the portal and again that's going to require some NIL help. Do I think that with Aiden Tobiasen and Dylan Batie and a couple of good difference-making guards out of the portal, could they could they get there? Yeah, you also have to retain everybody. But, I, you know, it's, again, if they go something like, if they win five games next year and you see some really alarming steps backward, that's a completely different conversation. But if they win 20 or 21 games and they don't go to the tournament, but they go to the NIT and you really like the steps forward, that you're seeing, then by no means is his job on the line. I would, I would, I would even lower that number from 2021. If they go 16, 16 next year, but you're seeing, Hey, these freshmen played 15 minutes a game. They really looked like they belonged and they're continuing to refuel. Then I, I think it would take a like collapse. Like uh, when Pitt had, what's his name from Vandy and they just collapsed. Like it would take mm -hmm. some like terrible things for him to be, have a hot seat next year. Yeah. Stallings um, was Stallings their coach. Yeah, I think so. I, I think it was Stallings team yeah. from uh, from Vanderbilt. And, yeah, yeah, Kevin Stallings. Look yeah. At me. Last question here it comes from our friend Varun Kumar. His question: He would have been able to tell me Kevin Stallings. He's going <laughs> to yeah. listen to this and be shouting Kevin Stallings at me, and then his name's going to be right after. You. Yes, yes. Varun is a is a Pitt graduate, but his his heart has always been in deeply entrenched in, in Philadelphia and college sports, particularly Temple. His question to us to close things out here, if you were a college athlete today and you had the following of a Zion, Bronny, or Shador Sanders, what are three brands or companies you'd love to do an NIL deal with? A good question. A fantastic yeah. question. I'm going to go one right off the top of my head. I think it, I think it personifies everything I believe in. It's not just a, a money <laughs> thing. It's a passion thing for me. <laughs> it's Taco Bell. Like Taco Bell uh, being number one. Answer. Taco I'd like Bell to being number one. That as well. They're good with advertising. They'd be like me instead of being instead of Devontae Adams, I'd be in there. I think I think Taco Bell is my obvious first choice. That, Do you think he crushed are you right Taco now? Bell in his house? How yeah, crushed are you right now that Kyle took what you wanted your answer to be? I'm not, because I agree. We can all get sponsored by that. They make millions of dollars off us alone, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> they got enough money. 
Can you guys can you guys imagine that, Declan? Our late night Taco Bell runs would could be free. We'd be celebrities. <laughs> Johnny's like sounds like such free. a little kid. You mean you mean that <laughs> we could go free. anytime we want? Oh <laughs> man. <laughs> um I think another one that I would do just based on the marketing, like Hulu with the live sports thing, I feel like I'd I'd be great in those commercials. Just like somehow, like whatever creative way that they come up to yeah, how are they gonna pun your last name into has has live sports? I, I don't know. <laughs> That's their job, not mine. I'm Zoe's there live to, sports. I'm, I'm there to look pretty. <laughs> what about the window wizards? Nobody beats Zoe's black. There, there you go. go. There, there you go. go. I'm gonna say ghost energy drink as well. Ooh. I think that'd be sweet. I think there's a market. Ooh. I think they need some brand ambassadors. You know, I you, uh, got, you guys have kept them afloat, from what I can see. That's an age thing. That you're you're missing me on that. I think that's if, valid. I think if you're going energy drinks, it's the white uh, monsters. No, know, I don't like that one. one. The it's white gross. monster is the best one. It's not even close. The sugar free one. Yeah. No, the the monster taste itself is just disgusting. The regular monster, yes, but the white one, like even the sugar free. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. The, it's not. That's not like their base. There's a sugar free monster, but then this is sugar free monster, like the lemonade thing, the white one. Oh, I like the lemonade ones. Yeah, it's the white one. Oh, okay. I didn't know that was uh, that was one what in existence. My apologies, John. My number apologies. two, Doc Breath's Cavity Busters. I think they'd be oh. a good nil for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just go out they, there. They, I mean, they're, they're huge. They're everywhere. <laughs> when like, you go into like Etna's portal and you're like, I want a dentist. They're like, would you like Dr. Bressler's Cavity Busters? Here's 45 locations. I thought when when I was living in Roxboro in like that 2004 to 2000, 2009-ish, 10-ish range or whatever, and they were at the top of Parker Avenue. I think it was like the Parker and Ridge. And I remember seeing it for the first time. I was like, what sort of, like, they steal teeth here and sell them. Like, they just, <laughs> there's got to be crazy stuff going on here. And then they just kept, like, building and building. And I remember saying to Todd Zalecki, like, dude, look at, look at them. I mean, they're, in, they're at Citizens Bank Park now. Like, they, they have just, just revolutionized the, the, the dental. I'm sure market. they haven't revolutionized it. I'm I, sure it's still dentistry. <laughs> But they, I don't know if they have like angel investors, but like they have taken off. all laundry. They're probably just laundering money. Oh, geez. <laughs> I hope we have good lawyers. <laughs> That's crazy. I would also say, uh, give me any law firm that goes against Morgan and Morgan. <laughs> There's anything I can do to get that guy you just want to come, out. You want to get rid of John Morgan? I hate him. I hate him so much. Get him out. He might not be licensed in your state, but that's okay. Yeah, it's he's the worst. Uh, just get him out. Any anybody that is going up against him, hit my line. Declan, I see you doing an nil pitch to help people get out of timeshares. <laughs> I don't. What would that even look like? I don't know. I just see you as the face of like <laughs> you made a bad financial decision. <laughs> Wait, whoa, 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 whoa! Well, what's that supposed to be? No, like you're is just he? Like, wait, is he going to be the actor that's portraying that the bad financial decision? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I've I'm been sorry. in I your shoes. I didn't, I didn't even. No, I didn't even mean it like that. I was going to say you're going to have this calming voice. Like, don't fret. I can get you out of it. No, I'm see, I could yeah. do that. Rymir would be better suited. Oh, that one's going to. Yeah, Rymir's going to make anybody feel like just relaxed and and comfortable in whatever whatever he's selling. Declan's yes. going to be like, here are the following countries that don't have extradition. You go to these countries, you're going to no. <laughs> run away from your problems. <laughs> this is a very unique NIL deal. <laughs> Ramir, what would you, what would you, what, uh, what NIL deal would you want to sell? What, what, what product? Hold would on, you hold on. First, first, I got to do the watches. Got to do the watches. <laughs> oh, but so only, I, I go only with the, the blue the, one. The I go ones. with the blue one, but that's still good. That's only good the purple ones. The purple mm. ones and the red ones. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like the orange fruit uh, snack. Okay. It's, it's terrible, so I will never get the blue bag. <laughs> so, like the strawberry ones are the best. Like the red bag, the, the all strawberry is the best. That's that's goaded. But the the wild berry, I guess that's called berries and cherries. It's yeah, that. berries and cherries. Yeah. You know what screws orange. with stuff like that is I've been buying. Uh, I used to be a big Starburst guy. I still am, but I don't eat it as much. And then I've been eating Jolly Ranchers because I'm just fully embracing my old life. And I, it, like you, five Jolly Ranchers will last you two and a half hours. You, you buy the bag the cavity of one. you buy the bag of Jolly Ranchers. You open it; it's always ninety percent of one color. 
guaranteed that color might change, but that bag will be like 90% of these blue cherry or like whatever, blue raspberry. I'm like, what the hell happened here? Why aren't I getting a, an appropriate <laughs> mix here? What it's about like a 90% of one. When Starburst used to be 90% yellow, and then here's a couple pinks. I get so many damn blue raspberries, depending on which batch of Jolly Ranchers I'm getting. Blueberry is the best Jolly Rancher anyway. Yeah, it's fine, but like, it's good. Like, I enjoy it, but I don't want to eat five straight of these. I want to have like, I like to go, I like to alternate, like blue, then red, then purple, then blue, then red. That is blue, 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 blue. Right. That cavity pick might be a little on the nose there, Kyle. <laughs> oh no, my dentist loves me. He comes in, he was like, "How often? How often do you brush?" And I was like, "Like once a day, man. Good." And he was like, "No cavities. You're killing it." And then we dap it up and we walk away. <laughs> 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 what What about like reviving a like some sort of like sneaker company? Like, what if Johnny and was one. like, "And one that was started by Pengrads." Really? Yep. I went to the M1 mixtape tour in like 2006. It was sick. It was sick. Um, what's the one that used to have zippers on them? Zips. Zips and Keds, right? Keds. Keds, Keds is what yeah. I'm thinking of. Zips is why um, Akron Zips are named the Zips. Because same thing. It was like they put it out to the student body. What do you want to name your team? And they were like, oh, these shoes have zippers and rubber and zips. Do you remember when Joe Montana signed a deal with Skechers near the end of his career? People, I guess it sounds about right. Oh, that's a great one. I want my third NIL deal to be the vortex ball that whistles while you throw it. The John Elway chucking the football has the vortex <laughs> tail and it whistles. That's going to be me instead. I don't know. Russell Wilson has a corner on that market. Everybody loved that ball he put out. It's like, do you, do you ever see the clip where it's George W. Bush talking about the war in Iraq or Afghanistan and he's on a golf course and he goes, now watch this drive and just hits like, a, and just swings a couple. That'll be me. I'll be talking about like really important things. I'm like, now watch this throw. And then 70 <laughs> yards whistling. <laughs> Cow gas. That'd be sick. What brand could you guys see me representing in an NIL deal? And I'm, I'm scared that I even broached that question. Just for men. I was thinking <laughs> crew necks in general, just like a crew neck <laughs> store. Just for men, what's it called? Uh, salt and pepper. Is that the the color where it like puts like yes, some gray in? Good answer. Yeah. Uh huh. Good answer. Any you, like you walk into CVS and you see my face, like, yo, dude, go to aisle eight. <laughs> um, <laughs> I see. You can take Shaq's icy hot patches. Dude, I should I should have one on right now. I threw yeah. up my back yesterday, as you know. Oh no! I think I'm two for two. I think this is. Um, <laughs> I think uh, oh, I'm the money. Sirius XM and your commercial can be how often you flip channels and then you know they could the <laughs> tagline could be never get tired you know because you there's always something for everybody I do. am I bad I'm bad in the car with that right? no no it's great it's just funny but I, I don't give the songs a chance is what you're saying no 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 I'm saying it's impressive because you have so many presets and you just flip through so I'm saying that should be your commercial this segment's gone on quite a while it has it, it has, has. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. If you've stuck with us this long, uh, have a great weekend. We'll be back next week. More Temple football, Temple hoops, recruiting updates. And starting next week, we'll be dropping the podcast on Wednesdays. So it has a little bit more shelf life throughout the week. You can enjoy the scoop that much longer. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks again for sticking with us for another episode. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah.